Welcome back, everybody, to the Getting Past the Premium podcast. We're excited today. We've got episode two with Dan Allison, and we're going to focus on his perspective around the life insurance industry and how we can take that model from transactional to advisory services and his experience uh, also being on the consumer end of that. So uh, with that, we'll jump in. Welcome to the Getting Past the Premium podcast. Welcome back, man. Hey, it's good to be here. Yeah, I hope Alex just got all of our uh, shenanigans on, on film in between there for a while. Always. <laughs> oh, geez. Um, yeah, so we're excited for, <laughs> for uh, episode two here, kind of continuing on that conversation of, uh, you know, as we talked in our first episode with you on it, you have a lot of perspectives around this industry, right? Um, and so today we wanted to focus around that in the life insurance space as well as your perspective around life insurance as a business owner and a consumer, um, essentially, uh, because you you went through it. You lived a lot of the things that, uh, you know, we are talking about on the podcast. Um, So maybe let's start there, just in your experience going through a kind of a transactional model as a consumer, and then we'll talk through the other side of it. Yeah, so we we had talked on uh, one of the podcasts we did together about this idea of – what are some of the things that stop advisors from being a little bit more holistic and talking about some of these things to drive more value to their client, more revenue to their pocket, right? And I don't think there's anyone that is more taboo than life insurance. It's, yeah. it's a dirty word and <laughs> uh, it's something consumers hate thinking about because uh, it involves mortality and acknowledging that you are going to die. And it's something that's hard to talk to people about, even though today countless people died, right? So I look at... Um, Again, if, if my job is to, to truly drive value and be of service to my client and they're taking a risk um, in the life insurance space, it's your job to talk about it. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, a few things from a high level and then I'll go into the personal experience that I've yeah. had that makes me kind of passionate about this stuff. Sure. Uh, first, you know, when we talk about life insurance, I always tell advisors there's two kinds, basically. The first is if you die prematurely. Uh, people you love will be financially devastated. If you say yes, if you check that box, then that's one kind of life insurance. The the premature death, and that's normally term insurance, right? There's a period of time where that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. You know, my kids are five and seven and nine. and Protecting against that financial Absolutely. If I die, I can't stand the idea of them packing up, moving out of the house because they can't afford it. So it's so cheap. Yeah. I don't understand why every single human doesn't have it in that scenario. It's because we're not offering it. That's that's the only reason. Yeah. I mean, they'll bitch about twelve bucks a month for, you know, a million bucks of life insurance, and then go spend nine bucks on a coffee. It's anyway. With you know, eight, there's that eighteen shots of caramel frappe something. Exactly. <laughs> and then the, the the second one is life insurance. It's strategic, in nature. It's us, using the construct of a life insurance shell to further a planning goal. Mm. So that could be, um, you know, I'm worth $40 million today. And when I die, depending on where the estate tax goes right now, which not going to go higher, yeah. it's going to go lower the threshold. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not real happy about the idea that $21 million is going to go to the government when I paid countless dollars yeah. to even accumulate that wealth while I was alive. So a strategy is to buy a policy so that that 21 million bucks comes in the form of life insurance. And the people I love, the charities I care about, get all that money. So it's really premature death, take care of the people you love, um, strategic, utilize it to advance a planning goal. Um, So I'm a good example. I always talk about my first company that I started uh, during graduate school in the mental health field. Uh, My partner and I started it. You know, we had never dreamed it would become a big company. I mean, we just had a passion for helping kids who had mental health issues and disabilities and Took out a ten thousand dollar line of credit from Wells Fargo <laughs> um, on his credit, not mine. Nice. It's like twenty two years old at That's the time. That's risk management. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> debt collectors after me at the time. Uh, we and we opened our little location, and and five years later we had five hundred staff and seventy locations and twenty million of revenue. So we, we were good at what we did, um, and then we sold the company. However, during that entire period of time, we had a buy sell agreement that was in place. Yeah. And it was funded with two hundred thousand dollars of life insurance, because wow. we somebody told us, "Hey, if you own a company, you talk to a lawyer and put a buy sell in place." And we were like, "Okay, cool, you know, you got to do that." We did paid the lawyer five grand, got the 
the, the leather thing and yeah. stuck it on the shelf, done, glad that's taken care of. Meanwhile, taking horrible risk. The so entire yeah, just a twenty million dollar company, two hundred grand of life thousand. insurance. So you think about if either of us died, which by the way, my partner Scott did die um, four years ago, five years ago, suddenly out of nowhere, died. Um, he he'd be short. I'd be short nine point eight million of cash. Yeah. Um, to buy. So what do I do? And, and but nobody. I was surrounded by PNC firms. You know, we had fifty, sixty vehicles. We had 70 locations, you know, we had 401k plans and financial advisors, everybody around us. Nobody said, hey, you've grown a pretty good clip. Has anybody reviewed all that stuff to make sure it's still good? Mm -hmm. uh, Because if they did, they would have, like we talked about on one other podcast, they would have identified a risk that we were unknowingly taking, that we were not comfortable with the level of risk should that event occurred. Mm -hmm. We would have mitigated the risk. They would have made a ton of money selling us life insurance to mitigate the risk. By the way, when my partner died, I would have probably still been the beneficiary of that policy. And he would have left. You know what I mean? Even though we didn't have the company, he would have kept the policy. Yeah. Um, or somebody would have got that death benefit. Mm-hmm. And it, that happens all day. So any advisor watching this who is in the business marketplace, really any marketplace, but business, I can't tell you how many owners we look at. And they are underinsured, uninsured. Oh, yeah. And every them. single day, they're taking that kind of risk. Well, so let's let's think about that scenario, though. What? Let's say that your partner had passed away when you guys were operating the business. You know, right at the end there, when it's worth the most amount of money, you now owe nine point eight million dollars to to his estate. Essentially, yep. what would have happened in that case? Just in your opinion, if he did not have, if we did not have the correct, insurance, correct, you had not done anything. And, and he had passed away when I'll, you I'll tell company. you the exact thing that would have happened. The absolute worst case scenario. He had 51% controlling interest of the company. And our legal document said that that ownership goes to yep. not his wife, oh. his ex-wife. Oh, even better. <laughs> Perfect. I've got an ex-wife who's my new business partner. Yep. 50 and has controlling shares of the company. That's what would happen. Yeah. It wouldn't happen because I would jump off a bridge before that happened. <laughs> so she would have 100% of the company. But, no. Well, Sorry if she's I mean, watching this. She, I, yeah. You've made a lot of life changes. What's her <laughs> name, Dan? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I, I'll say her initials, Sally Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go to YouTube and try to find her. That was I lied. She's uh, on the dark web, uh, I'm sure. Uh, she's long gone with his money. But no. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and that's that's the case every single day. Um, oh, but, it really is. Yeah, how many companies is uh, we're gonna have to pull a rabbit out of a hat? Big Al, maybe back us up. How many companies are sitting out there like this today that were in your shoes? That still like the delivery mechanisms have gotten a little better. The advice, like we talked about in our last episode, it's gotten a little bit better. But I, I feel like it's. 80, 90% of the companies out there, their values changed from yesterday. Like, it's still not right. Are we going with the 820 rule again? I get, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Like, what's your thought on that? There's kind I, of. I, we have uh, my, my insurance company, uh, Brokers Clearinghouse. One of the services that we provide is we evaluate uh, owners, companies. So we, we provide a value. What's a company worth? We do it with a team of attorneys and CPAs. So we don't personally do the work, but it's complimentary. But we say, here's what your company's worth. Then the lawyers evaluate their legal docs, okay? Yep. And the end result is preparing reports to say, here are red flags if they exist. So I can tell you out of thousands done, uh, how many did not have red flags, substantial red flags, zero. Every single one. And sometimes it's value related. Sometimes, hey, we acknowledge the company's worth $7 million in the buy-sell, but one little thing, we never funded the buy-sell. So somebody That's said, oh, yeah, go common. get life insurance yeah. for the, and they never went and did it. Mm-hmm. So it's like, cool, you did the work on the legal doc, you're still screwed. And it's almost every single one. So you look at like a PNC firm as a great example. If you insure a business and you insure their, you know, their equipment or you insure their building or the cars and you're working with this person and every year when you do your review, they're like, you're insuring more stuff. Well, they're in growth mode. Yeah. I will promise you that owner does not know what their company is currently worth. Mm -hmm. We look at COVID, we just came through that. A lot of owners may have had a decline in business. And I promise you, they don't know. 
what is it currently worth? And, and so I liken it to um, the time to find out what your home is worth is not when there's an offer on the table to buy it. You should know the entire time you own that asset, what is the value? Nobody would own a 401k and not know what it's worth, what the mm -hmm. balance is, right? But people do it every day with businesses. So it's like if that, and, and these business owners, that's their golden parachute. In their mind, how are you going to retire? Yes. Well, the business. Sell the business. So do you have a strategy for how you're going to do that? Well, no. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, that's like having a, it's the way I feel about Bitcoin. It's like, cool, it's worth 90 million a share. Yeah. How do I get it out? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's like, well, that's an important data point, right? How do we get it out and buy stuff with it? It's what business owners do every day. Yeah. And that's my, that's my retirement. How you getting it out? Don't know. What if you die before you get it out? Don't know. Yeah. I didn't know we could bring you on to talk about Dogecoin. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, let, let's gotcha. make sure that's not a rabbit hole we go down. It's yeah. so true, though. Uh, uh, I yeah. mean, you're striking all the chords around all of it. And well, like, I was going to also say, though, because it's, it's a risk to the business, whether you're life insurance, on the life insurance side of the business or not. If you're an advisor to your client, that is – your business probably goes out of business Yeah. when that event occurred, as we uh, were talking about. So if you want to think about the ultimate risk to a business is something that could cause it to no longer exist. Mm -hmm. And this is something that is way too common that could be, you know, a hundred percent risk to the company. Um, and so again, even if you're not the one that may be funding, maybe you don't even, you don't even license to write life insurance. You should be asking about that risk to the client because yeah. there are people, and then align yourself. What we talked about on, on the first episode, go out and align yourself with somebody that can do that. You know, bring a team behind yeah. you that can say, "Hey, I'm your PNC guy, got all that set up really well." But how are you handling? You know, your partnership with your uh, with your business partner, and if something happens to one of you, yeah, and then go find somebody that doesn't. Right? And, and we we talked about on the first one. It's like, so how do advisors begin to make progress toward this? Mm -hmm. And my one of my comments was first, you got to start by getting out of your own way. Yeah, um, meaning I can't think life insurance, life insurance, life insurance is the mitigation tool. Mm -hmm. If they yeah. have risk, forget the, the solution, focus on the diagnosis of the issue. If it exists, that's it. That's your job. Diagnose yeah. risk. Here it is. Why well, I don't like that. I'm not comfortable with that. Okay. Well, let's look at the different strategies to mitigate that risk. Yeah. Who cares that it's life insurance or long-term care or disability? Who cares? That's the tool. Well, yeah. How many times do you go through a risk analysis process if you have the right mindset and come out on the other side with this client doesn't need a product. Right. They've got it. Yep. But their buy sell isn't up to date anymore. So they need to go visit with an attorney, but everything else is in line. Right. And so, you know, we use some stats on the PNC side that <clears throat> when we're talking to prospective clients and whatnot around what takes companies out. And it's not being insured perfectly. Yeah. Like the insurance works great every time as intended, as written in the contract. You're per you're good to go. Yep. If you pass away, you know, and everything's up to you, like your money's going to flow, they're going to stroke a check. It's all of the other risk that exists outside of where these products live as solutions that nobody's talking about. Right. Nobody's advising on. Like, I mean, do you have any experience with, it sounds like with uh, some of the programs you guys have at BCH that it's way more encompassing than just products. Yeah. Well, the, the thing for PNC is a good example you brought up, right? I always tell PNC firms that if you insure the business owner's factory, amazing, right? If it burns down, no sweat, you know, it's stressful, but here you go. Here's your check. If he's in the building when it goes down, he didn't do anything. The big new building is pointless. There's nobody to operate the business. And his family didn't care that you built a new building. If you insure their vehicle and they total it, awesome. Yep. New vehicle. If they're in it when it gets totaled and they don't survive or they get disabled, you didn't do anything. So it's like understanding you've got to take that next step to say we don't just identify and solve for risk on stuff. We, we go beyond it for the human part of it because it's important.
um, and say no to it all you want, and that's fine. Uh, but yeah, so evaluating business owners, though, they they are so busy and put their head down and don't like to look up. To get their attention is almost impossible. Working in the business, not on the business. Completely. Very Never taking a step back yeah. to say, look what I've built. And, and do I have bubble wrap around it? Because again, we talked on the last one, the ultimate goal is someday to have the money, to be able to take the money and never outlive the money. Mm. And if you die with it, it goes where it should, right? Yeah. The same thing with a business, right? Let's bubble wrap the thing while you grow it, while you do everything. And someday you're gonna wanna ride off into the sunset. And that can mean your children take over. That can mean you sell it to a key employee, whatever it is, but you wanna monetize it at some point. But it's that bubble wrap the whole way as you as you get to that point that people fail at. Mm -hmm. And it's because those conversations aren't fun. It's not fun to talk about disability insurance, yeah. be, becoming disabled. But when you ask somebody if you had a machine in your basement and that machine printed off what you, you know, you make 120 grand a year. If you had a machine in your basement that printed 120 grand a year, <laughs> every year, forever, would you insure the machine? Well, of course. Probably. You're the machine. Yeah. That's it. You're the machine. You're printing off that money. Insure it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not going to get disabled. Okay. <laughs> I made you. <laughs> famous last word. I mean, but I made you aware of the risk. Yeah. That's, that's where it breaks down for advisors to me. They don't take that step. Yeah. And, and so it's not the client's fault. Well, I totally agree with that. And I think there's a, there's a step in there, though, that I think is easier for advisors to realize that they can do. Because I think it's, we talked a little bit on the last one, transactional to advisory, right? It seems like a mountain to climb sometimes. Right. But you can be in that transactional model and bring a ton of value to your clients by asking them three questions. You know, at the time you're going in to talk to them about their PNC, just figure out what are the top three things that, you know, might be worth, even if you have no, it has nothing to do with the PNC insurance or whatever, or life insurance or name the product. And go in and just ask them, hey, you know, when was the last time the buy sell was updated? Business has really grown. And if they say, holy crap, hadn't thought about that. Yeah, can you help me with that? And if you say, no, that's not what I do, but let's figure it out together. You just provided, had that happened in your situation, mm -hmm. back to our hypothetical scenario, you guys probably could have figured out a solution, even if whoever brought that that risk up to you wasn't able to solve it, right? And you guys would have been in a much better position and probably saw that person in a lot better light, yeah. right? A lot more value. And so I think it's just that it's understanding that you don't have to go from where you're at today, if you're in a transactional or whatever model, and become an advisor tomorrow to be able to provide this value. Totally. You know, it's learn, educate yourself a little bit, and figure out how you can go out and talk to clients about these types of things, right? Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you look at, um, I'm 45 and uh, years old and, and, I've always said, you know, I got a, I got a stock portfolio and I've got a, um, you know, real estate portfolio and I own a couple of companies. But if my plane goes down tomorrow, the most valuable asset I have is my life insurance by a mile. That's good. That is the most valuable thing to my family that I have. And so, and that was a transaction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't care that somebody earned a commission and it was a transaction. I care that if my plane goes down. That's not going to be my last thought at all. Yeah, that's um, a great point. So if advice is given <clears throat> through an advisory-based model, is it okay that product people exist? Mm -hmm. And like, does that change your thinking around it? Or like, how do we get to that? Because it's like without – what we spent a lot of time talking about in the last episode was – Product people without an advisory based model is a broken delivery system. Right. If we have the right delivery system and we're having the right advisory based model, is having product people that can maybe be way more experienced uh, with a particular product or knowledgeable, yep. would that be like, I mean, would that be all right? What do you think about that? 100 oh, To me, again, if, if I view all, all a product is, is a tool to mitigate risk. So there's got to be a human being that distributes the, the tool to mitigate risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it takes the onus off. The problem with life insurance is it used to be sold to in, in the wrong way. I mean, you, people bought too much. They bought the wrong kind, whatever. 
if you're identifying a gap in somebody's existing plan that creates a risk that they're uncomfortable with, and they say, I want to, if I can get rid of that risk, I want to, they don't care that you say that guy's going to do it. Yeah. Because I'm 100%. not the expert. He's the, they could care less. Mm -hmm. I don't care that the pilot on my airplane is not also serving me peanuts. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> That's her expertise. Yeah. He can be up there. He's coordinating <laughs> air traffic control. Important job, right? Yeah. They don't look to you to, <laughs> to be the delivery system for everything. Mm -hmm. Your job is to identify and mitigate risk, period. Sometimes you're the solution for that risk. Other times you got to collaborate with other people that come in and deliver it no differently than a doctor does. Yes. Doctor comes in, he diagnoses, he says, all right, I'm going to recommend you go see this guy and here's why. Yeah. Okay, I'm running to that guy because yeah. I want the benefit. I'm not comfortable with the risk of having a torn meniscus yeah. and continuing to go running. Okay, go see that guy. He'll knock out that risk. I don't go, oh, you sold me. <laughs> right? Yeah. Now you made a ton of money, but we don't so view true. doctors like that. They're solution providers. Yeah. And once we start looking at ourselves that way, I, consumers will feel that. Yeah, It's not sales. Well, I think it goes back to, and I think we're, we're coming up here, but uh, it's something you said on the first episode that I think is a good way to kind of close out our little two-part series here is, I think our industry has to get back to understanding that we sell inherently important solutions to our clients. Whether you look at that as selling a product, a transaction, or a true advisory model, if we view it in that light, it's almost incumbent upon us to make sure our clients have those products in place, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we have to do our job to identify those areas of need and help the client find the solution. Um, but with that, man, that was awesome. Appreciate you coming on. Next time I'm having whiskey. Yeah, it's next time we'll wait yeah. till day you won't 76. Be in, uh, yeah. I don't know what this 75 Some P90X trial. Yeah. yeah, that's too hard. I tried that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I even tried watching that guy on mute and I couldn't do it. He's so, <laughs> he is so annoying. Said some of the cheesiest oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. Tony Horton. <laughs> Shout out, Tony. Yeah. If you're watching, Tony. Yeah. We'll tag him when we Give us a thumbs up. up. <laughs> All right, yeah, man. Take care, man. Thank Thanks, you. guys. See you.